QSO Today, Episode 438, Paul Topolsky, W1SCX. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest amateur radios and accessories for your ham radio station, and by Nuts and Volts Magazine. Save the date for the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, March 25th and 26th, 2023. Follow the link to the Expo website for more information. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. Tickets are on sale now for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo coming next month, the weekend of March 25th. We will be on Pacific Daylight Time and actually start on Friday at 6 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, March 24th. Our theme is New Amateur License, Now What? And while this might seem that we just want new hams, we really want every ham who is new, returning, looking for a new ham radio direction, or experienced hams that just want to help bring others to success. Please use the link in the show notes page to get to our Expo website and registration. All of the presentations that will be at the Expo are posted on the Expo website. Almost 40 riveting ham radio options for all of us. Paul Topolsky W1SCX was my guest in episode 133 in February of 2017, six years ago. I wanted to reprise this episode as well as point out that Paul is always one of the first to help us as a speaker or expo moderator. Paul was just meters from ground zero working the communication center when terrorists struck the 2013 Boston Marathon, killing three and injuring hundreds of spectators and participants. Paul shares with me his ham radio story, his experience, and how he continues to make a difference to his community in this QSO today. W1SCX, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Paul? Yes, I am, Eric. It's a pleasure to meet you this morning. You are dead full quieting into Gardner, Massachusetts. Paul, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, you know, very early on, I knee high to a grasshopper. Uh, my father had plugged a lamp into a wall and uh, sparks proceeded to come out from the from the outlet and the whole living room went dark and I watched his dad change the fuse and then pull a uh, a new plug out of the uh, out of the drawer and promptly replaced it on the uh, on the cord and I says this is really cool <laughs> I didn't even know what cool was then but it was uh, it was something and uh, you know the sparks in the wall kind of sparked something in me and so very early on, you know, when I got into school, it was all about anything I could find on electricity and, you know, batteries and flashlights and wires and hooking things up. And uh, it was it was it was an obsession. I knew pretty pretty early that that was where my life was going to go uh, into the into the technical stuff. Do you remember any books from the school library in those days? They certainly didn't have enough. I don't remember the titles. Uh, there was probably only about. Uh, you know, I'm going to guess at a, at a dozen books out of the entire library to do with anything with electricity. And they were very quickly consumed uh, by me and at the at the weekly library sessions that we went to at grade school. Uh, so I was always hungry for some new information. Once I, once I got older and into my teens, uh, my neighbor uh, had purchased a, a cabin cruiser and uh, – Back then, VHF Marine was rather early and exceedingly expensive. So he and his uh, fellow boat people decided to get CB radios in their in their boats. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the Western New York area on the Niagara River, and marine life was uh, was great. I mean, Gloucester, Massachusetts, has nothing on on us in North Tonawanda, New York. Um, so anyhow, uh, of course the CB came home and made it into his car and I thought that was absolutely amazing. And, uh, the other thing I saw radio wise that, that just 
thrilled me was the Motorola Motrack and the uh, Adam 12 police cruiser. Uh, it was a very, uh, very cool thing for me back then. So I, I knew that uh, radio was important. And then uh, through the local radio shack that had finally opened up in town, discovered shortwave listening and shortwave listening led to ham radio and ham radio led to joining a club and was a member of the club for about uh, 10 years or so uh, before uh, real life interjected itself. And uh, that's where it all basically started for me. As a shortwave listener, did you have a shortwave receiver? Yeah, I had several of them. I had uh, purchased uh, a uh, night kit star roamer. It was, it was already built. And uh, the store owner, uh, the Radio Shack uh, owner, uh, gave me a hand fixing it in his back room because the uh, the builder had made some mistakes and we troubleshot that and got that working. Uh, later on at the uh, radio club auction that we'd have every year, every year I picked up a uh, Night Kit R55 and eventually uh, got a, a DX150, um, the realistic DX150, which was a, a very nice receiver. For me, it was as good as it got at the time. And what did you like to listen to on shortwave? Oh, it was just about everything. You know, of course, the international broadcasts were there. I enjoyed history class and social studies classes. So whenever we had some project to do or something, I would, uh, you know, try to find out what's going on in that particular country when we were studying that country's history and come up with something directly off the radio. So that was always helpful to me. And, of course, I discovered the ham bands, mostly the AM stuff, um, the Star Roamer wouldn't receive uh, the uh, single sideband. However, I did build a Q multiplier for the Star Roamer. Of course, once you get the Q multiplier to oscillate, there's uh, there's your carrier, and I could at least listen in on the uh, uh, on the uh, single sideband on the Star Roamer. And of course, the uh, R55 uh, did receive uh, CW and SSB without any problem was made to do that. So that's that's how I discovered him and had a blast just listening in. Now, you sent me some stuff before we started, actually yesterday. And one of the things that you sent me was a picture of you standing next to an orange tent trailer. And you talk about some early exposure to ARES. Or was that field day? That was field day. Uh, back in the early 70s when I discovered the Amateur Radio Association of the Tonawandas, the ARATs as we call them, uh, I joined that club, and that was, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, September, October of maybe 1972 or so. And they, you know, at that time, there were, I think the first meeting I went to, they had a slide presentation on this thing called Field Day. I said, this looks like a lot of fun. I can't wait to do that in June. And I went down there that June, and uh you know, was introduced to ham radio through the North Tonawanda Civil Defense and a guy by the name of Walt McDonald, K2VOX. And um, every year at field day, I went to about 10 field days with the ARATs, and every year that pop-up trailer, tent trailer came in, <laughs> I never knew who it belonged to. The guy would just bring it, drop it, and he would leave, and he'd come back on Sunday and pick it up. Um, so that was... Um, that was the, the trailer that you're talking about. And inside that trailer were uh, some Drake twins. And, the, you know, I just went into ham overdrive at that point. I said, this is, that was really, that was something else. When you talk about ham radio, the first thing that comes to mind are those, are those Drakes because they're just such a classic, iconic radio. And, uh, you know, in the day, you know, you had Drakes, you had Collins and, you know, those are the guys that uh, that were really doing well, uh, financially anyway. This guy just dropped the trailer off and left the rigs in there too? No, the rigs came from someplace else. But uh, he, yeah, he was a, he was a club member uh, and he didn't participate very much. Uh, you know, I don't know if he had a job on the weekends or, or what his story was. I, I just never knew who owned the trailer. But it was there every year. When did you get your first license? Well, the first license came along in 1991, and it was more of a happenstance than anything else. Um, back in 
1990, um, the wife and I were on a trip back to western New York, and we got caught in a snowstorm. And uh, we had no idea that the New York State Thruway was closed. And here we are plowing snow in a Pontiac. Um, and three little kids in the back seat. This ain't right. I got to do something. So a little later that year, I, I got a CB radio just to have in the car for those frequent trips back to Western New York from Massachusetts. And uh, that led to meeting some uh, really nice guys here in, in Gardner, Mass. And one of the uh, gentlemen, uh, Don Setsko, WY1A, um, at the time, uh, he was uh, retired Navy, and he did communications. And he always wanted to get his ham license. I always did. I never got around to it. And we had five other folks in our in our citizens band group that, you know, says, hey, that sounds like fun. Let's do it. So we had our own little class, and, uh, you know, Don taught the code. I talked the tech stuff. And uh, all but one of us had gotten our, our license and are still active today. The call sign that you got then was not the one you have now. Uh, my original call was uh, November 1, India Papa Golf. November 1, I'm Paul of Gardner. And uh, that was a great call. Uh, you know, I enjoyed using that. It was not, not a bad call for CW. Uh, but um, once the vanity program came along, um, I very much wanted to have uh, a sister call sign to the ARATS call sign of W2SEX. So, um, you know, I studied hard and got my advanced class license so that when the, uh, when the gate opened up for the advanced class licensees to apply for a vanity call, uh, I indeed did that. And uh, you can choose up to 25 different call signs. I only put one down, and that was W1SEX. And fortunately, I was granted that call sign, so it worked out for me. So the reason you have the call sign isn't probably the reason that most people hearing your call sign think. Oh, definitely not. It's uh, and that, that's why I put the uh, QRZ bio up there just to uh, give some people some reference. Uh, particularly when I had that call on my license plate on my vehicle, I'd get questions all the time, and I says, "Well, yeah, it's about ham radio and stuff," and you know. And, Right down on a little piece of paper. I says, go to this website here, and you can read all about it, why, why I've got that call. It's from your love and admiration for the A-Rats group that you would belong to as a kid. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there were many Elmers there, and some in particular. Then, uh, it was a great time, and, and using that call sign on field day, it, it, of course it got attention. Of course, it probably picked up a few extra QSOs I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. But, uh, yeah, it's a great call. It definitely definitely helps out in the, when contesting. Uh, so it, it a great call sign. You have a lot of fun with it. You, know, you do get chided every once in a while, but most everybody understands. And particularly those that are not hams, uh, once you explain what's going on and, and they read the, uh, the bio page at qrz.com, then, uh, yeah, it works out nice and uh, have a lot of fun with it. So do you want to recognize any Elmers or mentors that helped you along the way? Well, in particular, the first one that I met was Walt McDonald, uh, K2VOX. He was a uh, the radio officer for North Tonawana Civil Defense. And uh, Walt was a uh, radio tech by profession. He had his own side business where he did uh, aircraft uh, radios, um, you know, the direction finding and the communications. And he also worked for a company that, uh, at the time, managed the entire radio system for the New York State Thruway Authority and the New York State Police. So uh, he, was, uh, he was a great resource. Uh, then we had uh, two other gentlemen that were, were in the club, and they were founding me members, Ralph Janowski, uh, W2RPO, and Milton Dexheimer, W2VCI. Uh, these guys were great hands, and they did a great job helping me uh, get acclimated to the hobby and taught me an awful lot of stuff. So unfortunately, Ralph and, and Dex are silent keys now, uh, but they were, they were great, great guys. A uh, funny story about Ralph. Um, I, in the uh, late 70s, I uh, studied for and became a paramedic. 
and I got an ambulance call one day to go to uh, Columbus McKinnon Company, which made chains, and Ralph was an engineer there. What he did specifically, I don't know. But I get a call to go there one day, and there's a gentleman there, and he's having some cardiac troubles, and I'm zeroed in and focused on taking care of this gentleman in the nurse's office at the at the plant and get all the vital signs and do all the stuff I'm supposed to do. And now it's time to move him from the, uh, from the table in the nurse's office onto the gurney to go out to the ambulance. And I literally have Ralph under my arms, pulling him over and look down and I'm inches away from his face. And, and I said, Ralph, what are you doing here? And and pulled pulled him right over, uh, so it, it shows you can get zoned in. But uh, uh, Ralph, in spite of what was going on, and and he was hurting pretty good, uh, he just he couldn't do anything but laugh. And you know we got him to the to the hospital, and he was fine. But uh, it was uh, Ralph was a great guy, and Dex and everybody in that club. And I still do make trips back to Western New York. I've been to a few meetings since uh, since then. Even worked a couple of field days with him. And uh, maybe even go back this year. We've got a graduation we've got to attend. So hopefully I can get back and work the A-Rats field day again this year. Do you remember your first rig? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Two of them in particular, a uh, Heath Kit HW101, a uh, ham at uh, the Simplex Time Recorder company that I was working for at the time. Uh, he had a, a 101 that he had purchased some way, some time, had trouble with it and uh, did some troubleshooting and couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And uh, so I bought that radio from him for $50 and uh, fixed it back up and had a great time for the first couple of years with the, with the HW101. And then another friend of mine sold me a Kenwood TM2530, uh, which is a, a great radio, and uh, got a story on that one specifically, but uh, I still have that. I still use it. And today, Don uh, regrets selling that radio to me because it is a really good one. So those were my first two ham radios. And now this message from ICOM America. Got cabin fever? ICOM has the rigs that you need to get into the field or to update your ham shack with a variety of base stations, mobiles, and handhelds. ICOM's newest 2-meter amateur FM transceiver is the ICOM IC V3500, or the V3500. This 65-watt transceiver has a compact body and simple interface. Its features include simple operation with a modern white display, instant volume loud and mute functions, emergency call and alarm features, and a 4.5-watt audio amplifier for loud and crisp audio. The ICOM ICT-10 is a dual-band VHF-UHF rugged portable that meets or exceeds standard military testing in its IP67 waterproof case. The ICT-10 can withstand any field activities ahead of it. Features include extra-loud 1500 milliwatt audio amplified speaker, DTMF front-mounted keypad, 5 watts of output power, 11 hours of operating time, and NOAA weather alerts. The ICOM IC7300 is our favorite high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed every ham's expectations for an entry-level HF transceiver. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. Features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. The IC705 is the perfect sidekick and QRP companion, base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package, covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 MHz. The IC705 features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall display, 5 watts with a BP272 battery pack 
and 10 watts when connected to 13.8 volts DC. Single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions. Micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger. Micro SD card slot and a speaker microphone, the HM243, which is included in the package. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the optional backpack, the LC192, with a special compartment for your IC705 with room for accessories and your lunch. Designed from user input, the ICOM ID5100A is mobile radio innovation taken to the next level. This rig offers an intuitive user touchscreen interface and connects with Android devices and Bluetooth headsets via the optional Bluetooth module. This mobile rig includes up to 50 watts output power, integrated GPS receiver, DV-DV dual watch, DV-FM repeater list function, D-plus reflector linking, and SD card slot for voice and data storage. Finally, the ICOM ID52A is a VHF-UHF dual-band portable with D-Star and FM functionality in a beautiful handheld package. This radio supports conventional FM communications and D-Star simplex repeater regional worldwide calls over the D-Star internet network. The ID52 features include a full-color 2.3-inch waterfall display, VV, UU, VU, and dual DV mode, Integrated GPS GLONASS receiver including grid square location, micro SD card slot, micro USB for data transfer, programming, and charging, and it is IPX7 waterproof. You can share the Android app for DSTAR operation, battery pack, and headsets between the ID52A and your IC705. So there you have it the wide variety of complementary ICOM transceivers to open up the coming spring SOTA, POTA, CONTESC, DXing, and EMS operation. You can find out more about these fine rigs by clicking on the ICOM banner in this week's show notes page. And when you visit an ICOM dealer near you to purchase one or all of these rigs, be sure to tell them that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. Let me go back to the HW101 for a minute because I see in a picture on your QRZ site that the HW101 is the centerpiece of your current ham station. At a time when I think that the HW101 was considered an entry-level transceiver, is it still the centerpiece? I see it, but is it still the centerpiece of your ham radio operation? To be up front with you, Eric, right now I don't have anything on HF. Um, if you look at the page, you see that the, the lab and the, uh, and the station were just set up this month. During the ice storm in 2008, all of my HF antennas came down. All of my equipment made its way over to the EOC where I was teaching classes, tech classes at the time. So I've got the station set up. It's going to remain as it is. And as soon as I get some HF antennas back up on the air, uh, that stuff is going back on the air, and the HW101 is going to be the centerpiece rig. That's where I'm going to be doing most of my operating. Um, I just like that radio so much. Uh, you know, Heathkit, I think that was Heathkit's best selling uh, ham transceiver. You know, the price was right, the performance was good. Uh, that CW filter in there is, is phenomenal. And it's just, it really is a great radio, and I really do enjoy operating uh, the HW101. The Kenwood 690s are superb. I've got them set up just the way that I want them with the filter packs. Uh, but the HW101 is, is definitely my favorite rig, and it's going to be, uh, that's the one that's going to be driving the SB200. Uh, so it, uh, yeah, you could say that's going to be the centerpiece, absolutely. What's your favorite operating mode? Well, obviously, uh, at this time, it's uh, single sideband and RIDI. Uh, I really do like the, the old RIDI mode uh, because it's uh, – the first time – the first exposure I had to RIDI was in the uh, January AWRL RIDI contest, and I had just gotten the PK-232. Uh, I had just gotten the one of the 690s at the time, and – you know, I got on the air and watched that contest, and it was—it wasn't like a contest I had done before. There was a 
you know, always a nice little exchange and, uh, and you know, not a full QSO, but there was always something going on conversation wise with, with, with every contact. And I also started looking the call signs up and they were, you know, uh, not generals were not, didn't seem to be as common as advanced and extra class operators. It was, it was a very classy contest and I really enjoyed it. So I've always had the, uh, a good feeling for radio teletype. Uh, I'm not doing digital modes at the present time. Uh, any of the, the sound card or software defined modes or anything like that. Uh, but that will be coming here in the near future. But radio teletype and, of course, uh, single side right are my favorite. Uh, CW, yeah, I could hold a conversation at five words per minute if I had to. Uh, but it's my goal to get my speed up for field day this year. So once the HW101 goes back online, yeah, that's going to be my main CW rig. Uh, in spite of the filters in the, in the 690, which make it absolutely great, I just really enjoy the older gear and, and the HW in particular. Did ham radio and electronics play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Well, when my in my education, ham radio really wasn't an influence because it, it came along uh, after high school, essentially, uh, for the most part. Uh, it was more that ham radio enhanced uh, my career than made the career choice. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, in my in my current line of work in law enforcement, uh, you have a lot of, in fact, almost all police officers who really don't have a clue about radio, uh, you know, how it works. They just expect and demand that whenever they push to talk that they be heard and not understanding radio puts them at a disadvantage. Uh, you get out there and you have an emergency and you have to get through and you know you're in a bad part of town and you know you need to have uh, a clear view from your antenna to the repeater and taking the radio off the belt sometimes makes a huge difference. So simple things like that from a communications perspective, uh, ham, being a ham, I can communicate over the radio better than others. Uh, from a technology standpoint, uh, one, of, one of my primary jobs is crime analysis. And knowing and understanding technology, uh, I think, makes me a better officer because I can, I can use, utilize that technology to help me do my job, whether it's uh, analyzing uh, calls through use, utilizing database, MS access, computers, and all the technology in, involved in that to uh, hacking a cell phone, uh, being able to uh, reconstruct a hard drive when the, uh, when the pedophile thinks that he's erased all his files and the evidence. No, that's not true. So knowing and understanding that, you know, you have a computer that's running a, uh, uh, a desktop unit and you suspect that there's pornography on there, child pornography, for example, um, how do you preserve that? What's the proper steps to preserve that? What are the proper steps to preserve uh, text messages on cell phones and so forth? And having a good technological background, I think, uh, gives me a better opportunity uh, to help solve those cases uh, above what other police officers do. It's open doors for you, essentially. Yeah, you know, most of my most of my life was spent in the in the technical business. I was a senior sales engineer at uh, at a company uh, here in Gardner and worked there for 25 years. And that was a great career and of course all of the experience of ham radio and electronics was what I did. But once that uh, that time passed and and I chose another career path, it certainly opened doors to say the least and uh, has made me a I think a superior performer in some aspects. So the career path that you're on right now is that you're, we were talking a little bit at the beginning about the bucket list. Is this a bucket list career change that you've made? No, I think it's more happenstance. Um, we were talking about my, my education path. High school was not a good time for me. It was, 
you know, I enjoyed technology, I understood technology, and you get that that geeky label, which nowadays is is kind of cool, but way back then, not so much. So high school was not a good time. Consequently, uh, you know, subsequent to that, it it it, w- it was great, but yeah, you know, I really didn't want to continue on going to school, so I never went to college uh, directly out of high school. Uh, I have, however, continued my education, but none of the courses that I've taken were centered around a particular uh, degree path. In other words, what I was doing at the time was the education that I was looking for, uh, what subjects I needed to to learn to improve my job performance. Uh, those were the subjects that I was that I was taking. Um, I had mentioned earlier that the uh, uh, the North Tonawana Civil Defense. Well, it involved radio communications, and I also had this uh, uh, this desire to be part of public safety. And civil defense was a was a good starting point. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I jo- joined the local volunteer fire department, um, got my EMT certification within the first year. Uh, when I got out of school, electronics jobs were not easy to find. And so I went into the uh, emergency medical business and eventually became a paramedic. Uh, and I've always had that public safety in. Uh, after I'd gotten my ham license here in Gardner, uh, we had a hurricane come through. And uh, so I consequently, uh, you know, became the radio officer, which led to me becoming the city of Gardner emergency management director. And that's opened up doors. Uh, once the job went away uh, at Simplex here, uh, then I got into, uh, uh, you know, dispatching because I figured dispatching would be a good way to work a midnight shift and go to school during the day. And uh, that worked out for a while. And next thing you know, I found myself really enjoying law enforcement. Uh, ended up going to academy at 55 years old, which was a, a trip in of itself and uh, ended up here and I was a, as a police officer, and my uh, my current, my formal, full-time title is the uh, uh, communications manager and crime analyst and dispatch supervisor at a local police department. So, uh, yeah, ham radio has definitely gotten me to where I am today. Uh, it's been a huge part of it and a huge part of my life. You just touched on it, and I think we'll go there. You're the agency director of the Gardner Civil Defense Agency. What is the Gardner Civil Defense Agency, and what role does it play in your amateur radio life? Well, what we call now emergency management is the outgrowth of the uh, Cold War civil defense, I don't want to say movement, but civil defense services. Civil defense right now, emergency management, kind of takes care of everything else. You have firefighters doing firefighter stuff. You have EMTs and paramedics taking care of emergency medical. You have police doing police stuff. When you get a disaster or an emergency, there are a lot of other things that come into play. Uh, And that's particularly centered around citizens. And I'll give you one example. Our high watermark for disasters here in Gardner was an ice storm in 2008. We'll get 20,000 people here in the city of Gardner. Now you're looking at December, uh, December 5th, and it's cold, and you've got a city without power for five days. you got to do something to take care of those citizens. That's what emergency management does. It takes care of everything else. Uh, if we have a, uh, a disaster in our rail yard, which is only two blocks from my house, what are you going to do? What's your procedures for evacuation? What evacuation routes? What are the special needs facilities that have to have services from emergency management? Uh, those are the kinds of things that emergency management takes care of in any community. How many members do you have in your civil defense group? We've got a crew of about 25 volunteers. Uh, subsequent to the uh, 9-11 uh, disasters in 2001, uh, civil defense became a much more recognized part of the emergency response in the community. 
And they came out with a program called CERT or Community Emergency Response Teams. And that is what our volunteer corps is based upon. And uh, we started our CERT program through uh, revitalizing RACES and the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. And our first CERT members were all hams, and they make up a core part of our uh, communications and command staff for uh, CERT here in Gardner. Your civil defense agency then is a combination of RACES. Does it include ARES, or is that something different, or is it applied differently there in Gardner? Well, in in Gardner, we have a formal RACES program. A RACES program is where your members are sworn to the community in which they're uh, members. The uh, Amateur Radio Emergency Service is a very similar program. Uh, however, it's not community-based. In other words, they can provide services to anyone. It's a uh, American Radio Relay League program uh, that organizes members. So uh, let's take uh, Hurricane Katrina, for example. Uh, Aries was activated and hams were needed from outside the area. And it's the ARIES program that provided those hams to go in from the outside area. Um, in Gardner, if I have a disaster or an emergency, such as we had in December 2008, I have members of uh, my group that make those initial uh, services, provide those initial services. And then I request ARIES from uh Worcester County and the, the rest of the area system that will come in and supplement the uh, RACES program. What kind of training do your 25 volunteers have to have in order to be able to participate actively? Well, the uh, CERT program, which was actually uh, created as part of uh, Homeland Security Presidential Directives 5 and 8, um, provide for a standard curriculum that is used across the country. Uh, citizens want to help out during disasters. They really do. If you look at the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake, I think it was back in 1987, 89, something on that order, uh, you saw pictures of buildings collapsing and buildings on fire and fire department responding, and citizens coming from absolutely out of everywhere, uh, humping hose for the fire department and helping out. So when a disaster happens, people want to help. They will help, whether they have direction or not. But with the CERT program, it now gives us the opportunity to come up with a standard curricula to train people to help out and maintain their personal safety. The CERT program also emphasizes and is a primary goal how to keep your family safe and prepared for disasters so that, number one, when a CERT member comes out to uh, participate and help out, their family is taken care of. They know that their family is safe because they've prepared ahead of time. So there is a standard curricula that everybody goes through in the program. Uh, for the uh, radio portion of it. Uh, we have nets every week that we practice on, and uh, all of our RACES members are familiar with the radio systems uh, at the EOC, and uh, yes, amateur radio is a very large portion of that, but these hams also operate public safety radios, which includes everything from local police and fire to regional fire and even the state police radio. Uh, that we have that will allow us to contact every other police department in the county. So it, it is a pretty extensive training program. It's a lot of fun, and uh, we hold classes, uh, a couple of classes every year. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is 
project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. Can you describe the greatest reward that comes from your involvement in your amateur radio emergency group, or maybe just in the Gardner Civil Defense Agency? Going back to that ice storm again and watching what happened in the shelters which we were managing, it, it was it was a really great feeling when you have hundreds of people packed in a school, they're going to be in there for days, and you know, it's it was a, it was a very large communal experience. You know, down the hallways of the school, you've got cots, you've got families in clusters, and um, you know, people says, "Well, what can I do? Can I volunteer? Can I do something?" And they come up and says, "Yes, we've got a gymnasium. It's all full of kids. Uh, you know, we've got some teenagers coming in. Can you?" Go create some games and have some games with the with the kids in the gym. Or, hey, yeah, we've got some videos in the library that we're playing. Uh, you know, helping out with the kitchen staff for feeding. Uh, it's it's a great feeling to know that you're helping people. You're making a difference in their lives. You're taking a bad situation and at least making it livable for these folks out there. That's that's a huge reward in of itself. And then for the CERT members, it, it's great to to find a CERT member that wants to come out and help out. And then you're training them. You're giving them knowledge. You're giving them new skills. You're introducing some of them to ham radio operator, to ham radio. And I've had a lot of them become hams uh, just to do the communications work uh, because they see the value of it. So, yeah, all the way around, it's a, it's a great, rewarding experience for me personally in just about every aspect. On the radio communications front with your emergency group, are you experimenting with or trying new digital modes for passing messages or upgrading equipment to modern, quote-unquote, equipment? Is that the direction that you're going, or would you give advice to other groups to maybe not do that? What mode are you guys in? We are mostly in the voice mode. You know, CW doesn't even come into the picture, uh, particularly because uh, the vast majority of the group are no-code technicians. Uh, we do have our radio equipment set up so that we can also work on the Mars frequencies. We've got some Mars members as well. Mars is mostly digital nowadays, but the expense of adding those particular uh, modems, it doesn't really fall into our budgetary uh, uh, expense range that we can afford to do that. Uh, we do have uh, the WinLink system, uh, which works on, on packet. Other than that, right now we're not doing anything, you know, PK31 or M uh, MT65 or anything like that. That just doesn't suit what we're doing at the present time. It's something I'd like to do here in the near future. Uh, our radio equipment is pretty much up to date. Our main HF rig is uh, is a TS-2000 from Kenwood. Uh, fabulous radio. It, it does so much. But not at the present time are we doing anything particular in digital other than uh, WinLink. You were actively working the Boston Marathon in 2013 when terrorists set off two bombs near the marathon finish line, killing three people and injuring hundreds of others. Can you tell us the role that your group played as this tragedy unfolded? Well, the Boston Marathon is a, uh, uh, a worldwide event. It's like having the Super Bowl come to your community every single year. Uh, planning, active planning is... Uh, six months. However, there's always something going on year round for the next marathon. Uh, planning for the next marathon starts two weeks after the marathon is run. Where we recap and uh, look at what we did and what we could do better. Uh, so from an amateur radio point of view, there's 250, maybe as much as uh, 300 amateur radio operators that come out and volunteer for that. Uh, that's set up in three different 
uh, distinct sections. You have a start line group, you have a course group, and my group, which was on the finish line. Uh, so it's a it's a, it's a huge undertaking, and uh, there's two there at the time there were two main uh, organizers, uh, Steve Schwarm, W3 EVE, and myself. Steve took care of the uh, of the course. I took care of the uh, uh, finish line, and uh, Bob. Uh, I'm gonna I'll remember Bob sign a uh, call sign before we get done, but uh, Bob runs the the start line. Uh, uh, K1IW Bob. Uh, so it's three distinct groups. Uh, you know, the, the course group is the largest because you're covering all 26 miles in a linear course, which is unusual for a marathon. They're usually circuitous in one way or another. Uh, so as the day goes on, the first group to start is the start line folks. And of course they finish first. And then, uh, the finish line people pretty much finish last. We're out of there at seven o'clock at night. You know, we're arriving at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning setting up. So it is a really big ham radio operation. Um, just to, to tell the story of when the bombs went off, um, I had had a glitch in the morning. The, uh, the flash drive that had all of my volunteer data on it got left back at home. So here I am with a room full of about 80 hams for the finish line and I'm literally recreating the assignment list right there on the spot and I that was uh, we, we got through it okay so later on during the day um, I look over to uh, my first uh, assistant uh, and I says to him I says you know other than the glitch this morning things are going pretty smooth he says yeah we are <laughs> It couldn't have been 10 seconds later and that first bomb went off. Now, the marathon is exceedingly well organized, organized to the point where they have a minute-by-minute -minute timeline of what's going on. And in my review of that timeline, I says, they didn't have any cannons going off on that timeline. They didn't have any fireworks going off on that timeline. And I'm pretty much sure. So I reach for that timeline, that that book. Well, and the second one goes off, and, uh, you know, I just got up out of my chair. I looked outside of the command trailer, and I saw the white smoke. And through my training, I knew it was it was an explos explosive that wasn't, uh, you know, a power transformer or something like that. I knew what was going on, and I just come on and says, that's a terrorist bomb. And I turn around and look at the guys doing the net control, and I says, we need an immediate roll call. And uh, they just look over and say, we're already halfway through it. Okay, these guys are doing a good job. Um, I picked up uh, the phone and couldn't get a dial tone right away. So I got on my portable radio and I called Steve, W3EVE, and in a very calm but concerted voice said Steve call my landline stat and um, he says received signed off and a few seconds later the phone went off and I says there were two explosions on the finish line uh, we're probably going to have to call the race and uh, you know that was that was the beginning of that of that story. It was, uh, it was something else. It was, uh, not something I care to repeat, but definitely, you know, it's, uh, it's, it was a life changing moment for everybody that was working there. Well, you had hundreds of casualties, you know, around the finish line after those bombs went off. What role did Hams play then? There, there were two points on that. Um, I suspected and confirmed later that, the minute those bombs went off, all of our public safety agencies, radio frequencies just went absolutely crazy and nuts with everybody just barking out. On the ham radio side, and we had two separate nets running, a logistics and a tactical net, and the hams just went silent. The whole frequency was absolutely clear because the hams were listening and waiting for information and instructions. On the finish line, the hams have two jobs. 
One is logistics, logistics providing support services, whether they're wheelchairs, first aid supplies, uh, water, food supplies, coordinating or communicating for the marathon folks and the other volunteers, those requests, right? Uh, the other is a, uh, a tactical net where we're actually communicating for medical emergencies. In other words, uh, you have a first aid captain set up in a zone and there's a ham shadowing that captain. That captain is calling for, uh, you know, first aid. They're calling for ambulances. They're calling for wheelchairs. You know, a rudder is down. So that's a separate, separate net. Um, what happened is that within 60 seconds, the cell phone system became unusable. Uh, everybody's calling everybody to let their relatives know they're okay, uh, for the most part. Uh, even myself, um, I called my house. I managed to get that landline, finally get that, uh, that dial tone, called my house. My wife answered, and I says, everybody is okay. I'm okay. Everybody's okay. If anybody calls, let them know everybody is okay. And she says, what are you talking about? I says, Janet, I got to go. Turn on the news. It hadn't even hit the news for a couple of minutes after I terminated that call that Janet knew what was going on. Well, I guess what I'm thinking of is there's obviously a role that hams played after the explosions as you're trying to clear the area, bring in emergency vehicles to pick up, you know, the casualties. And so my original question was, what role did the hams play in that aftermath? As far as the hams are concerned directly in what they were doing, uh, we don't have a hands-on for the uh, the treatment of patients, right? We're there to be the personal assistant of an official, whether it be a team captain in one of the uh, uh, in one of the zones, and the zone is where you have uh, nurses, uh, EMTs providing direct care to runners that require it. Uh, we have uh, orthopedists. Uh, doctors of all kinds that are on the course and in the two medical tents. The only communications between the, the doctors, the medical tents, the medical tents themselves was ham radio. Cell phones were gone. They were totally useless during that event after that, after those explosions. So it was the hams that provided the logistical communications and the tactical communications for the medical tents and the treatment of those patients, right? We have police, fire, and EMS, and Boston EMS is world-class. They have their communication systems, and we augmented the support of them. So our customer were those other agencies. And uh, particularly the communications between the two medical tents uh, was critical. Uh, information such as uh, missing limbs, torn limbs, casualties uh, were coming back through our network. And I was indeed relaying that information through the state police 800 megahertz system back to mass emergency management. So they were, they were a couple of minutes behind. Uh, as I mentioned, Janet didn't know what I was talking about when I called her. And it was still a few minutes before the news came on. Uh, you know, down at Mass Emergency Management, they're just hearing a, a tremendous amount of radio traffic. And, you know, with our information, it was, it was seriously augmenting what they were doing down there information wise. So what was happening? What was going on? The ground truth information, uh, was what the hams were providing, uh, back to Mass Emergency Management and so forth. Uh, but the, uh, but the main part was, getting coordinated supplies and uh, personnel to the medical tents. If you're a terrorist and you're going to blow something up, probably the worst place on the planet to do it is the marathon because the medical response at the Boston Marathon is absolutely intense, extreme in comparison to other marathons. So the, the services were there. Uh, a lot of lives were saved just because of the level of, of medical services that were already right on scene. You're very active in Elmering and teaching new hams for the technician and general class amateur radio licenses. 
Are there educational opportunities for newly licensed hams to continue to learn and grow in the hobby in your radio club? We're always encouraging uh, people to be active, not just on the radio, but to share their knowledge. Um, I run a lot of ham radio classes, uh, you know, technician class and general class in particular. And, uh, you know, I try to in, in, instill into the, into the students, you know, the social aspect of the hobby and, you know, going and setting yourself up in your shack and, and, and isolating yourself, uh, is, is not what we do. I mean, it, ham radio is every bit as a social hobby as your local bridge club. Um, as your, uh, you know, your service clubs, uh, the Lions, the Eagles, uh, uh, your uh, military, such as American Legion and so forth. I mean, ham radio is a social hobby. Uh, so we always encourage the hams to learn new things and pass that uh, along. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that hams uh, can do best for the hobby is to introduce amateur radio in a uh, in a clear and concise way to non hams, and you know explain what we do to them, uh, due to uh, uh, doing ham radio to these people who are uh, not associated with, it, or view ham radio as a dying hobby of uh, outdated communications modes and techniques. Uh, you know, thinking of a uh, you know, 50s vintage radio receiver they might have seen on TV. When you look at some of the gear that's on the on the market today, that costs five figures. I mean, it's uh, it's as modern a hobby, is probably more modern hobby than most anything else on the planet. Uh, so we always encourage our our people to to share the hobby, whether it be with uh, something you've learned new and share it with the club. Uh, and the other members, or whether uh, you're sharing it with somebody outside. Uh, you know, we have a uh, 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 a large list of guest members and an open forum at our uh, at our clubs. You, you learn something new, share it. You know, if you need information, you ask a question, you go to the open forum. If you have something that you've been doing that's interesting and others would be interested, you go to the open forum. And of course, on the personal one to one. You know, whether over the air or, or in person, uh, always encouraging that communications and always encouraging that interaction between the hams to enhance the hobby and make it more fun. So the hook then, you think, is making ham radio more social and involving new hams in these social activities? Uh, absolutely. With uh, you know, we've recently uh, uh, increased our Saturday morning. Uh, club breakfast and uh, and coffee meetup from once a month to twice a month because uh, it's an opportunity in in an informal environment to share what's going on, what's doing, what's happening, what's the latest antenna you played with, uh, you doing a new digital mode, uh, where were your contacts last, have you been, caught any new DX, uh, what's going on in the different nets that you might participate in. Uh, so yeah, social part of it and and the interaction of the local hams is the strongest asset we, that we have. And uh, we really need to uh, in enhance uh, to help make the hobby stronger. We will return to our guests in just a moment. Nuts and Volts magazine is a new sponsor and it's an amazing resource for new and old hams alike. Click on the banner to get your online or paper subscription of Nuts and Volts. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. I was looking at the pictures that you posted on QRZ with your test lab. And to say that you have a very complete test lab for ham radio would be, I think, an understatement. Can you explain how you acquired most of the equipment and how you use it? Well, as far as acquiring it goes, I think that's a pretty amazing story in of itself. It really started out early. Uh, when I was in junior high school, uh, I, I was absolutely thrilled to get into wood shop. 
But I knew the next year was coming electric shop. And, of course, I was all over that. And I wanted to – I couldn't wait for that class and had a great time for those 13 weeks that we spent in an electric shop building stuff and learning about electricity and uh, and a little bit about electronics. We ended up building a little crystal radio. They, they even – if you remember Burgess Battery, remember the Stripe batteries? They had a kit that you could actually build build a pair of D-cell batteries. They had all the components, the chemicals, everything that you needed to, to build that kit, uh, to build a battery. I mean, that's the level that we had in there. And, uh, of course, when you built your battery, you had, to, you had to prove that it worked. And so they had some Simpson 260 meters in the class, and uh, you would do a, a dead short test on that battery and find out how many amps it would it would supply, and then of course what the voltage was, and you know how well how well you built the battery it was part of your grade. And uh, out of that cabinet full of Simpson 260s, sitting in the back was this Ico uh, 536A meter that was just sitting all by its lonesome. And uh, I don't know if the instructor did this on purpose or if he did it uh, by accident, but he pulled that out, and I think you could see the spark and the flame by this time growing in me. And he pulls it out, and he tries to uh, uh, see if the if the meter had worked and, and put it on the ohm setting, and uh, indeed it did not work, and, and he handed it to me, and he says, well, I'll tell you what, if you can fix it, you can keep it. I was just thrilled beyond all belief. I got home, and I noticed a little switch on it. It said DC, and on the other side was AC ohms, and the switch was on DC. So I don't know if he did that on purpose <laughs> or not, but here I was, the proud owner of a 1,000 ohm per volt uh, multimeter. Uh, you know, as a junior high schooler, and you know, it just it just grew that flame ever more. Um, and then, of course, working uh, through high school, I was at a uh, radio and TV shop and learned what the limitations were of a 1,000 ohm per volt meter and, uh, you know, started purchasing test equipment. And when I made the move from western New York here to central Massachusetts, a lot of that stuff, but not all of it, uh, was sold off before the move. Uh, but certain things like my first tectronics oscilloscope, my 453, that came along. A bunch of other stuff that I had came along. And uh, the the uh, the uh, fleet, if you will, has been growing ever since. The neat thing about all of this stuff is I, I would come across stuff more by happenstance than anything else. Uh, you know, somebody had an old piece of gear. He says, here, you want this? Do something with it. Uh, my IM28 Heath kit was, was just one example of many of those things. I haven't paid a lot of equipment, uh, a lot of money for equipment. I did buy a new oscilloscope and a new signal generator, uh, a power supply and a few other new things, but not a tremendous amount. I actually sat down and tried to remember what I've spent in my entire lifetime on test equipment and come up with a figure of, $2,300 over my lifetime. That's uh, an amazingly low amount of money spent on a lab. Um, I get a call one day from uh, a, uh, a teacher at a local Votech school, and he says he's interested in some tectronics equipment. And the natural answer to that was, oh, well, yeah. And he says, well, put a letter together thanking the school, uh, what you would do with some Tektronics equipment and how you're going to use it. Come on down and collect it. They were going to throw the stuff in a recycle uh, bin, and they were going to pay some really big dollars to get rid of this Tektronics stuff. Uh, so next thing you know, I've got four 7,000 mainframes, a curve tracer, uh, a uh, – uh, a TM-503, which you can slide different instruments into. And just for the, the cost of a few minutes in front of the computer and a letter saying thank you. So, you know, for the, for the young players out there, uh, this doesn't have to be real expensive. And you can get some nice stuff for real short dollars, especially at the ham flea markets. Uh, you know, 
there's a gentleman out there, Vern, and I forget who his call sign is, but if you uh, Google the, the 10 buck test bench, uh, Vern has made a, uh, a point of finding, refurbishing test equipment that he's purchased for either next to nothing, nothing, or $10, and very rarely anything over that, and show you how to set up, set up a complete test bench for 10 bucks an instrument or less. Uh, so Vern, uh, Vern's doing a great job. I wish I could remember his call sign at the present time. But look up 10 buck test bench and, and you'll find him on YouTube with a really great series of, of videos. Uh, but as far as what the lab is, um, yeah, I, I use it a lot. I, I'm in the lab right now. Current project on the bench is a filter for a power supply that the club had bought for our trailer, which is all full of RF noise. So here we are winding uh, six inch diameter common mode chokes with eight gauge wire. That was fun. We did a video on a video that yesterday that may show up on the YouTube. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not just for my benefit, but it's for the club. And, you know, I've had people ask me, says, Hey, I got this radio or I got this, that, or the other. Can you fix it for me? Says, no, I don't think so. Tell you what, you bring it over and we'll fix it together. And you get to learn something and I get to learn something and we get to use the lab and, and have a great time doing it. So that's pretty much the mode that we're, that I'm in. And uh, even before I had the lab formally set up, uh, what I had for equipment and so forth. And, you know, was, I always tried to share with, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the club and, and my friends in ham radio. So it's a great asset for not just me, but uh, for ham radio in general and in the club in particular. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? It depends on how you want to look at that. Uh, my kids, um, you know, they're glad that I've got a hobby that keeps me busy. You know, the wife would often say, I really don't like that. What you did ham radio? And, and I says, well, I could figure out some other hobbies. Well, why don't you? I says, well, you know, I could, I could go to a bar or you know, do drugs or hang with the boys or, uh, you know, how about, um, you know, how about a, how about an extramarital affair? And if I could find those hobbies and all of a sudden, yeah, all right. <laughs> she knows where I'm at and what I'm doing and I'm accessible. Uh, so she's, uh, she's doesn't, doesn't participate in the hobby though. She does some of the social things the club does. Uh, she'll show up at field day. One of her favorite things is cooking and, um, uh, when our uh, EOC was over at the South Gardner Fire Station, we every year for field day, we'd have real firehouse chili, and she makes a really mean chili. Uh, we'd have that for field day, and her lasagna and a couple other dishes that all often end up at the club function. So she's supportive, um, though she doesn't partake in the hobby particularly. Did any of your kids end up becoming hams? Uh, no, I had, uh, I've got the two daughters and a son and, uh, they know it's a big part of my life and they support it. Um, and you know, they've gone to some of the ham functions as, as well, but, uh, you know, I'm the sole ham. I even tried the reverse, uh, uh, reverse psychology one time. It was Jana, you ought to really get on, get into this. I mean, it's a lot of fun and all. And she was an electronics technician. Right. She worked at Simplex as well on the assembly line and then ended up going to school for electronics. Oh, what are you going to do with that? I don't care for that stuff. Said, well, okay. I says, dear, if you, you know, if you want to participate, we're here. Otherwise, I don't have to share any of my toys. <laughs> that didn't even work. What can you do? Oh, it's all right. What excites you the most about what's happening in ham radio now? I think right now, the the innovation that we're seeing in digital communications, particularly at HF, it's absolutely fascinating where you can dig signals out below the noise level. I mean, like, holy cow. You know? uh, I wonder what the military is thinking of this. I know they've got a lot of advanced stuff, and maybe they're already doing it. I don't know. But all of a sudden, you know, uh, we were having this discussion at breakfast yesterday where Jack, uh, W1P, I've said, he says, He's doing 80 meter international contacts long after propagation has gone away for every other mode on JT65. I mean, it's just a phenomenal 
communications mode and the discoveries that are going on in that area. Um, you know, you're looking at the new radios that are coming out. Uh, I'm not really particularly keen on operating a radio from my laptop or my, my desktop computer. But when you have something like the ICOM 7300 come out, where it's all SDR but looks like a real radio, that's exciting. Uh, you know, you need a new feature or there's something you need to change in it or they find a problem, you're not in there soldering. It's a software update. No problem. Uh, that, I think, is the, right now the most exciting thing going on is what's happening with this real cutting-edge technology. Uh, go back to their previous comment about what people think of ham radio. They think of, you know, the old guy in the closet with this old gear and, you know, not really understanding how advanced uh, amateur radio is. It, it just all the new stuff is, is just fabulous. It's amazing. And the pricing is amazing, too. Um, I'm working on a radio for a ham here in town, and I see 775 that he would like to sell. And uh, it's just about ready to go. Uh, but every minute I wait, the re resale price on that thing seems to be going down. Uh, discussion in the, at breakfast yesterday. Uh, I says, I've still got the 775. And he says, well, you know, you were looking for a thousand bucks for it, but for three hundred dollars more, I can get a 7300, and I can do so much more with it. How can you argue with that? Uh, a brand new radio that is a top-notch performer compared to something like ICOM flagship radio 15, 20 years ago. It's just absolutely amazing with the with the new stuff. That's the most exciting part right now. Right, the new stuff sets a new bar for evaluating things, which means that for people that are entering the hobby that may not have a lot of money, there's some really fine rigs for not a lot of money. Absolutely. You know, even if you go to an entry level lit rig nowadays, let's uh, I think the ICOM seven eighteen, I believe, uh, is one of them. I mean, they're just fabulous radios. They work really well. And, you know, does it work as well as a KWM-2A? I don't know. I've never worked a KWM-2A. But I know you get on the air, you listen, and you make contacts. And it's very, very short dollars compared to what it used to be. Uh, I remember, you know, when I, uh, when I was in the TV biz back when I was in high school, uh, you're looking at, uh, when color TV first came out, it was five, six, seven hundred dollars to buy that TV back in the late fifties, early sixties. And then when I got in in the in the early to mid seventies, they were the same price. Uh, yet the price of everything else is going up. Uh, so your income to cost of TV is is shrinking and shrinking, and that formula is still working today. Uh, you're getting a 60-inch high-def TV, maybe even um, 4K for that six to $700 range. Uh, you know, you find your, your bargains out there. And, and it's so far advanced from what they had back in the early, early 60s for a color TV. So uh, what did a KW... Um, 2A cost when it was new, all right, and then adjust those dollars to today and find out what you're getting for a new radio today. The, the bang for the buck uh, is certainly great, and the the, the cost to income ratio uh, is uh, is ever shrinking, uh, which is probably uh, one of the reasons why Keith Kid is no longer around, is that uh, that disappeared. I do remember the HW101. I think, wasn't that in the Heathkit catalog in the early 70s? It was almost like $350. That was a lot of money in those days. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think the minimum wage was like a dollar eighty or something. Yeah, I remember a dollar a dollar eighty five. I think, is what I started at the, the TV shop for. And I couldn't even think of getting uh, anything close to that. So in today's dollars, that HW101 would be more than IC7300. Yeah, more than yeah, more than likely. I would I would say that I, we could look that up online and find that out. But 
yeah, when you're looking at a basic entry level rig that does a does a pretty good job on sideband, does a pretty good job on CW, and that's it compared to those same dollars spent today, it just blows your mind uh, what the, what the capabilities these things are. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? Get to your local club. Uh, find a good club and make sure that uh, you, you find one that fits what your interests are and has the uh, the social aspects that you enjoy and stick with stick with a good club. Uh, join several clubs. Uh, each seems to have its own interests. You know, clubs that uh, you know uh, really into digital clubs, into contesting clubs, into public service clubs, into the technical stuff. And then you got general clubs that uh, you know try to encompass all of that. And then now you're down to the individual. The knowledge base at a club is phenomenal for learning new things, for asking questions, um, just the plain social aspect of it. Uh, a club is so, so, so important. How many classes have I taught where you know you bring in a dozen new hams and a third to half of them you never hear from again? Granted, some of them are outside the area, but uh, you know they they don't get on the air, they don't participate. We try to encourage them to do that. Uh, one thing that our club does is when you take one of my classes, you get a uh, a year membership in the club for no charge. Uh, so we try to keep the people involved, but the clubs are the are the core of the knowledge. That's where you're going to find your Elmers. And when you when you look for an Elmer, not necessarily one, there could be many Elmers. Uh, you know, what's your interest? What are you concentrating on now? You're trying to get your HF rig on the air. You're trying to get an antenna up. You know, there's there's people that just love to play with antennas and and help you get your rig on the air. And then, you know, you know, a couple months down the line, okay, I've gone past that. Let's try these new HF digital modes. And then you have other Elmers in the club that, you know, specialize and, and concentrate on digital. Uh, you know, you're doing your, your public service, you know, who, who's in the, who's in the club that's, you know, one of the Aries officials or your local emergency management. Uh, you know, who are these folks? Um, you know, even, even FM and repeaters. I mean, a duplexer is such a magical device. How can you possibly understand what it does and why it's important and what's involved in a repeater? I mean, you know, ask these questions. Find the clubs. The people in the clubs are going to have the information that you're looking for. Uh, clubs are just so important. This really isn't a, a solitary uh, hobby. I mean, you know, you, you know, in, introverts... Not allowed. And some of the members have just an amazing test bench, you know, to bring your radio to. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I think you find, I think you find that's that's not as common as a well-equipped shack. You know, you've got some support for your shack, but you know, the test benches, I, I think, are are much more rare than a well-equipped, well-maintained, well-operating shack. But yeah, they're out there. It's good to know the hams in your club that have one. Oh yeah, I mean the learning opportunities there. Um, you know, I got I got to admit, you know, the, the technical part of the hobby is is what gets me most excited, and that's where I spend most of my time. That's why, I've, you know, I've invested my time and energy into into building the lab so that it's not just for me. It's so I can share with my friends and. Uh, you know, Saturday morning was a was a typical thing. I went to breakfast and was, hey guys, I've got a solution to the noise problem. Here's what we got to do, and and uh, here's here's what I found in the trash that we can use to to do this. I found that, you know, found these uh, uh, theatrical dimmers in a recycle bin that somebody was going to pay big money to get rid of. Well, we were going to repurpose them. Anybody that says a ham isn't ecologically minded, <laughs> doesn't know what's going on. Uh, I mean, we recycle stuff and use stuff like crazy. Even the new carpet in my lab is made of recycled soda bottles. Uh, and now I'm using repurposed toroid coils out of a dimmer uh, and big ones. So here we are trying to wrestle 
eight gauge wire uh, on this uh, toroid to make a common mode choke uh, for the filtering circuit. And you know, breakfast. Hey, he wants to come over and 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 help out. And says winding this coil's a two man job. <laughs> they were amazed. It really was a two man job to wind this coil. Uh, so you know that you know you got a problem, you got a question. One of the things we did at the club, uh, I get questions about refurbing old equipment, particularly tube equipment. I says, well, number one, you don't want to do that unless you've got some help. If you've never dealt with high voltage stuff before, because it it will bite you and sometimes bite you in the worst way. Uh, but if you want to learn how to do that, a great place to start is refurbing the necessary equipment. To refurb radio so i says go to the flea market and the flea market that we had uh the last one people were running around buying up all the btvms you know everyone that was out there <laughs> seemed to have gotten bought up and i, I think people were thinking why are the, why are the btvms going like crazy and it was because our club members were going around buying these things up and he says we're going to bring them back we're going to we're going to do this one hour before club meeting we're going to have this session and we're going to all right step one we're going to look at your btvm we're going to get your documentation we're going to identify the capacitors and the components that need to be replaced like uh the selenium rectifiers and and that's going to be step one and we're going to get a bill of materials together we'll order the parts and the next one will start tearing apart and rebuilding our VTVMs, refurbing them, and then we'll have a calibration session. And then we'll put them all together and see who wins the prize for having the most basket case to the uh, to the best looking and best working VTVM. And it was a, it was a fun project. It was it was not a lot of money commitment. It was very very short dollars. It was an opportunity to do something that you hadn't done before. You're learning something new, and you're also discovering: Do I really want to get into refurbing old equipment now that I know some of the steps that are going to be involved? And even if you found that you really didn't care for it, you took your five dollar, ten dollar uh, investment in that BTVM and parts, and now you've got something that went from a five or ten dollar item to something you could sell for. 30, 40, 50 bucks on eBay. So you get your money back and then some. Uh, so it was a win-win situation all the way around. Or in the end, you end up with a really nice VTVM that you have on your bench. Yeah. Next year, 20 megahertz oscilloscope you bought for $10. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we had a we had a session one night. Uh, 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 you know, one of the you know we have a uh, a technical talk or a guest speaker, and I brought in my array of analog and digital meters and i and i sat a guy down with my uh, ico thousand ohm per volt meter and i says here's a circuit and i says you remember ohm's law and i had two 100k uh resistors in series and i says we're feeding 10 volts into these 100k resistors so if you remember your ohm's law remember that from technician class it will evenly divide, so we should measure five volts across each one of these. And everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. I says, okay, come on up. And he puts the thousand ohm per volt meter across that, uh, across one of those resistors, and he's reading nothing. I says, well, are you sure you've got the source voltage? And he measures across the source voltage, 10, 10 volts right on the money. I said, and then go, well, maybe that resistor's bad. Go across the other one. And uh, he goes across the other one. There's no voltage there. And he says, well, what's going on? Well, one of the resistors is open. I says, well, try and take the power off, do a resistance test. And he had continuity. Where'd the voltage go? Where'd the voltage go? And then he eventually went from 1,000 ohms per volt to 20,000 ohms per volt to 100,000 ohms per volt on the meter. And now you're starting to see the voltage, and you're explaining where it went to. Now they understand why a high input impedance on a VTVM is important particularly if you're working on tube circuits that are high impedance. So it's those kind of little lessons that, you know, like to bring along. And, yeah, having a VTVM is a must for everybody, right? And, uh, you know, a digital multimeter has the same input impedance. But oftentimes a digital multimeter isn't going to help you when you've got varying voltage or you're trying to tune a circuit. So, you know, just those kinds of lessons 
uh, are important and you bring those little tidbits along to the club and it just enhances everything. Paul, I want to thank you so much for joining me on QSO today. I know that you did a lot of preparation before our QSO, and I think it paid off because this was a lot of fun, and I think that the listeners as well as myself will enjoy this immensely. So with that, I want to wish you 73, and thank you so much for joining me on QSO today. And 73 to you, Eric. I really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, Your QSO Today podcast is a is a great service to the hobby. We have a lot of history, and a lot of it's already written down, but I'm glad you're capturing some of the personal history and some of the personal passion that goes on in the hobby. Uh, I thank you very much. Your service is uh, much appreciated, uh, at least from, from this laboratory position. So, again, 73, thanks. It's been an honor, and I uh, hope to catch you on the air someday soon. Okay, Paul, 73. Bye-bye. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Paul. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in W1SEX in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for their continued support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of this fine sponsor by clicking on their link in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, click on the transcribe button at the top of the show notes page. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. By using the Amazon link on the home page before you shop at Amazon allows Amazon to send us a small commission on what you purchase that further keeps our QSO Today project going. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as we work towards episode 500. QSO Today is now available on a large number of podcast players and now a host of podcast services and applications. We are Podcast 2.0 compatible. I now use the Fountain Podcast Player to listen to all of my favorite podcasts. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG. 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.